influences and that's why um, I wanted that whole reggae drive brought into it you know on the one and the three rather than the two and the four um, and when the the first kind of shows we were able to I think the second gig we ever did was the Rock Against Racism gig because one we totally totally agreed with every principle that they went on. There was no caveats, no like, oh, they're a bit lefty or whatever, because I'm a bit lefty too. But, you know, everything that they stood for, I agree with and I believed in, and I will still defend them to this day. They were kind of maybe different to some of the organisations around now, but in the essence, they weren't, you know, you weren't actually hanging around with a bunch of po-faced, you know, oh, people, you know, everyone trying to be nice to everyone they were kind of blokes and they had a point of view and it was a relevant point of view so they always made a point of having these mixed bills really good bills and the second like I said the second gig we did um, the headliners were Misty and Roots and 999 and Misty and Roots were a Southall band from out that way and one of my favourite bands ever and how they weren't huge when all these other kind of slightly less it's like they're still pulse actually and that they were fantastic bands yeah. and as well you know as well had to go pop over here in the end but you know they were easily as as good if not better than some of the bands coming out of ja um so anyway we were playing on um our second gig and we thought well we'll ask we didn't have enough equipment so we went to 999 so you know we borrowed an amplifier and um because we thought well you know they're punks we've been to their kids you know they're punks yeah we're all together all together and the guitar player's like well i don't know because like, i've got my settings to sit on my amplifier and no i don't really want you using it and one of the guys, we didn't dare ask Misty and Roots because they were the headline band, and we're thinking, oh my god, Misty and Roots, so, oh, they're so big, I forgot all the equipment they got. And one of the guys from Misty and Roots overheard us, and he came over and said, you know, hey, you can, whatever you need, guys, you know. Mm -hmm. And our bass player looked, turns around, and they've got their bass stacks the size of a fucking terrorist house, you know, and our bass player's like, yeah, <laughs> can I use that? And they're like, yeah, 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 brilliant, you know. <laughs> so we get all the equipment we need. No thanks to 999. Um, and we start doing our gig. Now, um, we were all kind of quite stoners in the band, except for our drummer, Adrian, who didn't take drugs. He, he drank happily, <laughs> not exceptionally, but he, he didn't, he wasn't, you know, around spliff smoking and stuff like that. So we're kind of playing away and we drop in a stand up and spit and we kind of boom, 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 and gradually this hole's filling up because we were still new on the scene. It's telling my God, what are these guys playing? And I'm skipping around on stage, and I keep skipping the side of the stage where all of Misty and their entourage are now there, nodding and digging it, and firing up these huge splits. And I dance to the side of the stage and, you know, have a couple of hits, come back in the middle. One of them leans out and passes splits to my the bass player, and Chris sticks in his mouth and carry on playing and you know we're getting toasted and suddenly like half we finish a song and then we turn around and Adrian's got up it's like oh god what's going on and we said Adrian what's the matter man he said there's a fire I think there's a fire somewhere 
<laughs> it was like these clouds of weed just wafting across. Um, but we did loads of gigs with those. We were, you know, band at Barry Ford at the Acklam Hall, you know, missed you a couple of other times, you know. Um, when we played with The Clash at the Rainbow, as well were on the bill, you know, and uh, they were like, you know, they were really good, good gigs to do because, you know, people actually had to, you know, they just got together, you know, and for a short window, it really felt like we could move this thing forward, you know, you could move it forward so that, and, and funnily enough, when we went to the States, and we play in our last tour, and we were playing Atlanta and places like that. There would be far more of a you know a multiracial audience mm -hmm. than I ever saw at any other gigs over in the states. And these were club gigs as well, you know. And I'd be backstage afterwards, and there'd be you know kids of all shapes and sizes, shoes and colours and creeds and everything, all all talking and wanting to hang out and, and know about you know. Reggae. I mean, you know, I, I was friends with people like Far Eye and you know, and, you know, guys, you know, of that ilk. You know, um, I mean, one of my, I used to go and hang around when we were signed to Virgin. A guy called Jumbo around the front line label, and his office was like, you know, Weed Central, where you just sit and get mashed and listen to all the latest tapes that have been sent in from. Jamaica and work out and I I was there, I'd been in there one day because I was, like I said, I used to hang out with Prince Farai and Niney and Niney had to get some something from Virgin and um, and I'd been in Jumbo's office and I came out and there was Niney, Prince Tony and I can't remember the third guy, I don't think it was Farai but there was this like thing going on between the three of them and money and watches and everything was changing hands and I was like, oh, sorry, yeah, 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 shouting and, and afterwards I was left with nine and said, well, what was all that about, man? He said, well, we're doing a publishing deal. <laughs> it was like, because I'd wanted Niney to produce the members' second album. Do you, do you know Niney? He's just like blood and fire and great producer. He's called Niney because he got into a fight one time and some guy cut off one of his fingers with a machete. Um, but he's a great producer, and I'd say, you know, band thought this was a brilliant idea, but then Virgin thought, hmm, great, going to put the members who were very fond of weed in the studio with this Jamaican guy who's very well connected with all that as well. Mm, it was probably going to be three years before we saw an album, but actually we would have done, they, I'd worked, you know, worked in the studio with guys, like that, and they would get it down. They would bang those fuckers down because they wouldn't be. They'd be like, "Yeah, and we know what we're doing. It's like sounds good. Sounds, you know, if it sounds good in this state, it's always going to sound good." And it's you know, but they mixed the idea and put us in with Rupert Hine, who's a lovely guy, but you know, he produced our album and then he saw us at the oh, Camden Palace. Yeah. And he came up to me and said, you know, I would have probably produced, I would have definitely produced your album. Not probably, definitely produced your album very differently. And I was like, oh, great. You know, because I, it was like, you know, oh, you've got to make it sound good for the American market. So why, you know? It was like,